Well, hello, and welcome to Dome at Home Special Edition. Boy, it's good to hear that wonderful uh, soundtrack in the background there. It is really nice to see you all. I'm your host, Scott Young, from the Manitoba Museum's Planetarium, the astronomer there, and a close follower of all things space. And we are gearing up to hear one of the biggest space announcements in Canada in probably... Um, a decade or so, I would guess. The Artemis mission, the plan to take humans back to the moon, not just to grab some rocks, but to stay. The first flight flew earlier this year, a big long uh, test flight with nobody but some crash test dummies aboard, and it worked perfectly. And so the next flight, test flight number two, Artemis two, will be taking four astronauts on a big loop around the moon, they're not going to go into orbit or land on the moon, but they will go around the moon and see that glorious close-up vista of the, the moon's cratered surface and see the beautiful planet Earth rising above the horizon, the, the Earth rise that has become iconic of deep space exploration. Four astronauts, three from the United States and one from Canada. And today we find out who those four will be. So that's pretty exciting. Um, Hopefully I can remember how all this gear works because it's been quite a while since we've done some shows. I've seen already there's a little bit of a focus issue, so let me see if I can work on that. We are going to be taking a look. Um, the NASA broadcast and the Canadian Space Agency broadcast begins at 10 o'clock uh, Central Time. So we have a little bit of time just to chat and to look at some of the pre... Um, the preview information. We'll talk a little bit about the mission, We'll talk about the four Canadian astronauts who are up for the job, so you know a little bit about them, and then we'll listen in as uh, the CSA announces which Canadian will be doing this first mission. And this is only, of course, the beginning. Canada, as part of its contribution, will be building Canadarm3, which will be attached to the Gateway Space Station, which will actually be in orbit around the moon, rather than going to the moon each time. They're basically going to build a space station there that will make it much easier to go down to the surface and back up and so on. Uh, it's a pretty cool um, way of handling things. And Canada will build its signature Canada arm to help assemble and operate that gateway space station. And in return for that, we get our seat on Artemis II and another seat on a future flight. Now, we don't know what seat that will be or what flight that will be, but we do know that the plan is for Artemis 3 to land right to land on the moon on the flight after this one. So odds are we will see Canadian astronaut on the surface of the moon sometime this decade. That's pretty cool. Let's take a look at, you know, some for some of you who might remember the uh, the early days of space exploration. We've been to the moon, landed there. We've got some rocks. Why are we doing all that? Well, Let's take a look at why the moon, and uh, while we do that, I'll get the focus fixed, and then I'll be back with you in just a second. We are going. The history of this agency is marked with broken barriers, once viewed as impossible, with science fiction turned reality with innovations that have spun industries all their own, and with demonstrations of peace for all humankind. We soar in the skies of our home planet. We maintain a human presence just outside of gravity, and we touch points all across the solar system and beyond. We're going back to the moon, and this is why. The moon is a treasure trove of science. It holds opportunities for us to make discoveries about our home planet, about our sun, and about our solar system. The wealth of knowledge to be gleaned from the moon will inspire a new generation of thought and action. Without fail, every major program and mission NASA has invested in has led to technologies and capabilities that have shaped our culture. The breakthroughs of the Artemis era will define our generation and the generations to follow. The tens of thousands of jobs associated with propelling us to the moon today 
are just the beginning of a lunar economy that will see hundreds of thousands of new jobs develop around the world. This is not an ambition of one entity or one country. The exploration of the moon is a shared effort. Woven together by a desire for the greater good. Why the moon? Because the missions of tomorrow will be sparked by the accomplishments of the Artemis generation today. Because the ambition to go has already begun. And because Mars is calling. We need to learn what it takes to establish a community on another cosmic shore. So let's camp close before pushing out. And so, we go to the moon now, not as a series of isolated missions, but to build a community on and around the moon capable of proving how to live on other worlds. We'll use the lessons for more than 50 years of peaceful exploration to send a new generation to the lunar surface to stay. We will anchor our efforts on the lunar south pole to establish the Artemis base camp, positioning us for long-term science and exploration of the lunar surface. We will prove what it takes to assemble a complex ship in deep space. We will perfect descending down to and returning from a distant surface. We will learn how humans can survive and thrive in a partial gravity environment. With improved spacesuit designs, mobile habitats, and with reconnaissance robots pre-positioning and relocating supplies. We will learn how to utilize the resources we find on these other worlds. Starting with finding water ice and purifying it to drinkable water. And refining that into hydrogen for fuel and oxygen to breathe. We will establish fission power plants on the surface of the moon, capable of supporting a growing community of efforts. And we will expand the logistics supply chain to enable commercial and international partners to resupply and refuel deep space outposts. None of this is simple or easy, but nothing in our history ever has been. The Eagle has landed. We got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. This kind of continuous lunar presence is a natural extension of all that we've learned in low Earth orbit. Body. And what Starting we will accomplish the there will ensure the monumental missions to Mars are within reach. As we ready the launch of the first Artemis mission, and as commercial companies ready their lunar landers for the first private payload deliveries, we have already begun to take the next step. So a nice little uh, teaser there from NASA on why we're going back to the moon. And uh, I mean, most of us, I think, probably understand the reasons behind it and things like that, but it's, it's nice to have it put so succinctly. Today, we will be learning the identity of the four faces behind those visors in the Artemis II crew. And uh, just to remind you, Artemis II is going to go all the way around the moon. Oh, look at that. That uh, image is... There we go, Artemis II. There. Um, it will launch aboard the Orion spacecraft on the Artemis, uh, the Space Launch System rocket, that gigantic orange rocket with the two side boosters that we saw go up last time with just crash test dummies. It will go out towards the moon. It'll orbit the Earth first just to get everything all, make sure everything's okay. They'll get the go to go to the moon. They will loop around the moon in what's called a free return trajectory. This is basically aiming for a spot that even if the spacecraft engines were to shut down, the whole thing would still loop around the moon because of gravity and be shot right back towards the Earth. So it's kind of the safest way um, to come back. And that's what they, um, you may remember in the film Apollo 13, they talked about that. That's basically what they tried to get the Apollo 13 spacecraft on when its engine blew up and successfully got the crew back to Earth. So gravity is a pretty powerful um, way to move your spacecraft around, and it doesn't use as much fuel. So that's the Artemis II flight, and we expect it by the end of 2024, which I know is a long time. Rather than racing to the moon, 
This is a more sustainable approach and the idea is, you know, don't go until you have a, uh, a reason to go and you're ready. The Orion spacecraft has proved itself uh, both in orbit and in um, on a lunar flight. The Artemis 1 uh, Orion spacecraft splashed down after about a 40 day flight. We got to see a bunch of that live and that was pretty cool. Some great shots. They finally learned, they put a bunch of high def cameras out on the solar panels that basically their only main job was to show us some pretty pictures, which is really important. Uh, it was it was kind of just like being there. So I quite enjoyed the, the stuff from that flight. And this is the thing that I'm, I always think is sort of the big iconic thing, seeing the earth rising over the surface of the moon. Um, the Apollo 8 astronauts saw that back in, in 1968 for the first time. We've seen it a few times since then, uh, largely from robotic spacecraft and then with Artemis 1, but a Canadian astronaut will be seeing that sometime in the next couple of years. And I know we, you know, in a way, going into space shouldn't be about nationalism and countries and, and patriotism and all that kind of stuff. It's really humans going to the moon. And I've always sort of felt that when, you know, when you're watching uh, an astronaut, no matter what country they're coming from, they're representing all of us, the best of us. But I got to say, there is something pretty cool about having someone from Canada get to be in one of those seats. It recognizes Canada's great um, contributions to the space program. We've got sort of a a bit of an unsung story of, of space excellence, not just the Canada arm, but dating all the way back to the earliest communication satellites and a whole bunch of technology and science that, uh, and aerospace that Canada has really become well known for on the world stage. And I think this will just bring that media spotlight to all of those, you know, potential careers for the kids that are watching this and, and, uh, sitting there in grade nine or 10 thinking, you know, what am I going to do when I get out of high school? What do I want to do? There's a lot of space related careers that are open to you that don't involve being the person in the blue suit, because let's face it, astronauts, they have a lot of qualifications. These are the four Canadian active astronauts. I have to break it to you. No, Chris Hadfield will not be the person named. I know everybody thinks he's the only Canadian astronaut. Uh, he certainly did a heck of a great job. Um, keeping us all informed when he was up on the space station and during, during his spacewalks and things like that, he's retired. Uh, in fact, all of the, the early astronauts have retired and we basically have uh, four relatively new crew. And um, so from the left there, we've got uh, Jeremy Hansen, um, who's been in Winnipeg a couple of times at the museum. We've had a chance to chat with him. Um, Jennifer Seide is... Uh, the next one there, and then Josh Kutrick on the center right. And on the far right is Davis, David Sejanc, who is the only one of the four who's actually already flown. He spent six months or so up in the International Space Station. Let's take a look at these four folks. I'm not supposed to make any predictions because, you know, nobody knows who's going to be announced. Uh, I have connections. None of them are fessing up. This is tight secrecy. So I do not know who's, who's going to be going. So we're just going to take a look at all four of them. I do have my favorites though. And because I've met Jeremy twice, I, I kind of hope that it's going to be him because he is um, a really wonderful guy. Jeremy Hansen from London, Ontario. He's uh, a fighter pilot, a uh, guy in the Air Force, and has all sorts of engineering qualifications and things like that. But is just a really well-spoken Gen genuine person and uh, I was quite quite impressed with his sort of humble nature you know you think astronauts fighter pilots they're all going to be like Top Gun right no I'm, Jeremy's a really a really nice guy um, and he did a great job working with the kids and things like that when he was in Winnipeg so that's that's something I really look for in an astronaut for sure that ability to not just do the job but to communicate it to you know you and me and everybody else the inspirational value so Jeremy's one of the four possibilities uh, David Saint-Jacques is uh, the one who has already flown. Um, he spent a little bit of time on the International Space Station. He's done a spacewalk. He's done some stuff with the Canada Arm. I suspect it won't be him because he's basically spent all of his training time working with International Space Station and that program will still continue. I suspect that he they'll keep him on space station flights, but you never really know 
course. He is the most experienced. And uh, both Jeremy and David are the, the senior two astronauts. They joined the crew, uh, the, the astronaut corps, earlier. So on the basis of seniority, you might think it's going to be one of these two. However, seniority is not the only factor, I'm sure. Jennifer Seide, Jennifer Seide Gibbons from Calgary, um, a top-notch engineer and scientist, and uh, the youngest of the astronauts in the, in the crew here, embarrassingly um, much younger than me. I used to think, oh yeah, the astronauts, they're kind of all my age. Not anymore. Boy, they're getting younger and younger. Um, the only four, one of the four Canadian astronauts, uh, active Canadian astronauts, uh, who is female. And so um, we're looking forward to seeing her on a flight at some point for sure, because I think having a, a Canadian woman, you know, go to the moon or something like that would be really inspir inspirational as well. I mean, just like nationalism shouldn't matter, gender shouldn't matter either, but there's a lot of role modeling that these astronauts can, can be doing. Um, I haven't spoken to uh, Jennifer before, but I look forward to um, seeing what she can do if she's given the nod. And then the last of the four, Josh Kutrick from, oh, typo there, Fort Saskatchewan, Alberta. Um, a test pilot, fighter pilot, engineer, quite, uh, quite an accomplished guy. And uh, so those are the four people who are up for that one Canadian seat. There will be three American astronauts, and NASA has already named, you know, I think they have 20 astronauts in training for the Artemis flights. So those are the kinds of, um, you know, they just have a much larger core of people to choose from, and it's, let's face it, it's their rocket, their foot in the bill. So they kind of get to choose who, uh, who most of the crew are. But it's super exciting to have the idea that there's going to be a Canadian uh, aboard. The NASA and Canadian Space Agency broadcasts are just starting. They're not gone to the live stuff, but they're basically doing the same thing that I'm doing, talking about, you know, the background of the mission and, and all of that kind of stuff. So it's, uh, there's nothing really to be um, discovered yet, but we have about uh, 13 minutes or so before the official beginning of the broadcast, and we're looking forward to seeing... Um, who these four people are. I'm just going to go back through the uh, the comments here. The chat has lit up like crazy. It's so nice to see all of you. Yes, thank you very much. And um, it's uh, yeah, it's it's nice to be back. Hearing that that waiting music, I was getting all excited with the uh, you know the the waiting for broadcast music that we have in the pre-show. It's like I I don't listen to that music anytime I'm not doing the show, obviously. And so it's 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 definitely nice to be back. Um, we do hope to have, um, Dome at Home has been on hiatus, uh, obviously for the last little while. That's, uh, you know, it was weekly, then it was bi-weekly, and then, you know, I've been off for a couple of, uh, of months, but I do hope to have some news for you on that front in the near future. Um, Kevin, don't be surprised when they announce your name. Yes, I'm sure that you are right up there on the list. Um, this is the first time, the, the last call for astronauts when, um, when Jennifer and Josh were, were hired. That's the first time of all of the astronaut calls that I did not apply. I applied uh, my first time, you know, Mark Garneau got my job, but um, I think I was 12 when that happened. Amazingly enough, they look for more qualifications than I had as a 12 year old. Um, and I've applied every time since then. I even made it past the first round once where I got to write the essay. So that was pretty cool. But I mean, if you look at these qualifications, you know, um, like David Saint-Jacques is a astrophysicist and a medical doctor and a pilot and a scuba diver and a, and a, and a, like they, they do everything They're kind of overachievers. And it, it makes sense when you're only got room for four people, you want as many skills as possible packed into that spacecraft. So yeah, Kevin, um, I will, uh, if they announce your name, I will absolutely fly off to Ontario to congratulate you uh, in person. How about that? Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, Peter, nice to see you as well from London. Yes, you have one of the four folks from London. Uh, we haven't had an astronaut from Winnipeg. One of the former astronauts, um, Bjarni Trigvason, had a connection to Gimli here in Manitoba, but we haven't had anybody from here yet. So uh, lots of... Uh, Oh, um, all four now have asteroids named after them. That's a really good point. So 
Um, one of the great things that Canadians do um, that is often unsung is that we do a lot of work in the field of asteroids and a lot of them are discovered by Canadians. Um, and there's just so many being discovered that, you know, they, you need names for them all. And so Peter in London and a few other people have sort of championed the cause of naming more asteroids after Canadians. So all four of these Canadian astronauts have a, a, lump, a lump of space rock named after them out there in the asteroid belt. I think they're all main belt asteroids. I, uh, I don't think any of them got the more unusual ones, but uh, that's kind of cool. So nice to immortalize our, uh, our Canadian astronauts and all the former astronauts uh, and the retired ones also have asteroids named after them as well. So, all right, um, let's see. We are coming up to just about the time when the Canadian Space Agency is supposed to go live. Uh, of course, in both cases, it's, you know, ministers and directors and politicians who will be making these announcements, and I'm sure that there will be some, um, you know, flag-waving and all that kind of stuff before they get to the actual reveal. Once we do get to... Um, the actual broadcast where they start to announce people will of course go live to that. Uh, I'm just making sure here. Yeah, CSA is running a lovely trailer right now, so we'll cut to that in just a second. Oh, hey, Boris, nice to see you. Friend of mine from high school. Yeah, our grad year, 1988, same year that Jenny Seide was, was born in Calgary. Wow. And, uh, oh, Kevin is popping a bunch of asteroid names into the... Uh, into the thing, yeah, um, uh, oh, Jeremy Hansen's uh, five, uh, 10, 521, excellent, good stuff. Okay, um, I'm gonna just do a little swap over here so we can start to take a look at what's going on with the Canadian Space Agency. Actually, I'm, I'm gonna pick the NASA broadcast right now because the CSAs seems to be, um, in a weird format. I was trying to get access to both of them and um, just some weird things happening at Canadian Space Agency, I think, in the way that they're formatting their image. So this is the uh, this is from the NASA feed and there's not a whole lot going on right now. They're just talking about, here's a little bit about Gateway, so we'll cut to that. Aligned with open standards, the Gateway can be expanded as new missions and partnerships develop, allowing multiple human missions on the moon at the same time and enabling ongoing science to be conducted even between human missions. The Gateway is also capable of adjusting its orbit to allow access to every part of the moon, something the Apollo missions could not do. But the real key in this approach is placing Gateway in a unique halo orbit to perfect the maneuvers needed for Mars missions. And with the growing list of commercial and international opportunities, Gateway is the ideal hub between Earth and all that lies beyond. Returning to our crew as they approach Gateway, the Orion must match the elliptical orbit of the station in order to successfully dock. Once on board, pre-selected crew members transfer to the Lunar Lander, while those assigned to Gateway remain on station. The Lunar Lander system itself is built for three unique steps. Descending from the halo orbit of Gateway down to a low lunar orbit, descending from low lunar orbit to the surface, and once the lunar mission is complete, launching from the surface of the moon and ascending all the way back to the orbiting gateway. Once back aboard the Orion spacecraft and undocked from gateway, the crew fire their engine once to break out of the halo orbit and once again to sling the spacecraft around the moon, placing it on a multi-day trajectory back towards Earth. As they near the end of this journey, the service module is released and the crew module is oriented heat shield first. Entering Earth's atmosphere at 25,000 miles per hour, the friction of air slows Orion considerably, while also subjecting it to temperatures of 5,000 degrees. With the Orion now at just 300 miles per hour, a series of parachutes uniquely tested and produced for this moment deploy, decelerating the craft to just 20 miles per hour for splashdown. So this is a pretty... Um effective way of dealing with a whole bunch of issues. I mean, there's the issue of going to the moon and being able to support longer missions and so on. But there's also the fact that, you know, the International Space Station is reaching the end of its days. Now, it's been extended a bunch of times, 
But ultimately, you know, it's starting to show a few issues in terms of, um, you know, there have been leaks, there have been um, failures of equipment and things like that. And yes, you can go out on spacewalks and use the cannon arm to fix all of those things, but it does take a whole lot of effort to maintain. At some point, we're going to get to the point where everything's off warranty and it's just too dangerous to maintain. I mean, some of those modules have been up since you know, the late 90s, and it's been inhabited since 2001. So, you know, if you think about your car and uh, how worn the seats are and, uh, you know, how many little bit spots of rust there might be after 25 years, and then think that each of those spots of rust could actually kill you if it lets all the air out of your car, that's, you know, it's, it's a pretty significant issue. So the space station is going to retire. Building another space station what more are we going to get out from that? I mean, sure, there is lots of work to be done and so on, but there are commercial companies that are actually looking at building space stations in low Earth orbit that will be accessible for that kind of stuff. So having NASA and the CSA and the, the other space agencies get together to build a space station in lunar orbit makes a whole lot of sense. You preserve your space station capability, you do something that so far, the, the private companies like SpaceX and, and uh, Bigelow and all those places just aren't able to do. They can barely do things in Earth orbit right now. They're just getting to that point. And it facilitates your moon landings and, uh, and all of that stuff. And it gives you really a jumping off point to go to Mars. You know, once you've got a space station that is relatively far from the Earth, you can start assembling modules there, say fuel modules and things like that for eventual trips to Mars. Now that's way beyond the scope of, of our story today, but it certainly makes a lot of sense for what's next for space, human space exploration. On the robot side, Canada is sending a robotic rover to the moon in 2026. That's already under development and it will be basically like a smaller version of the rovers we see on Mars, and it will go to the South Polar region and do some exploration there looking for water ice and all sorts of things. So there's, there's a bunch of explorations that are going on here. Um, let me see here, there's some, some questions here. Uh, effect cause or cause effect says Kevin, you need to have an asteroid named before you can go into space? Well, I think David St. Jacques went into space before he got his asteroid. Um, so I'm not sure which one it is. Uh, I seriously doubt that everybody who gets an asteroid will get to go into space because there's a lot more asteroids than there are seats. Uh, Boris is asking, I wonder what the challenges were to attempt to get it back into Earth orbit and then back to the ISS. Oh, um, going from the moon to Earth orbit and then rather than just coming straight home, actually staying in orbit. Yeah, that's actually a really tough problem because when you're coming back from the moon, you're coming back really fast. And the only reason that we can sort of make it work is that the spacecraft bleeds off all of that speed through friction as it comes through the atmosphere. The atmosphere acts as a brake, basically. Up in orbit, there is no brake, so you'd need to use big engines to slow yourself down. Otherwise, you just go shooting past the Earth and off into space. So actually coming back to an orbital position, you know, standard orbit in Star Trek terms, is much harder than just landing right in the, on the planet. So I think that'll probably be the case for, uh, for quite a while. Okay, it looks like, well, we have the starting soon block here coming from NASA, so I'm gonna flip us over to that. I'll probably stay pretty quiet, but uh, feel free to drop stuff in the chat and I'll answer any questions that I can. Let us just get this ready and get the audio ready. And let's see who's going to the moon.
It's a new era of pioneers, star sailors, thinkers, and adventurers. Go, 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 fight up, go. All right, go, go for launch. Our destiny is always to go and see what's further and what's next. That was awesome. Good morning, good morning, and welcome to Ellington Field at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. I'm Joe Acaba. Thank you. I'm Joe Acaba, Chief of NASA's Astronaut Office, and I'm joined by Norm Knight, Director of NASA's Flight Operations Directorate. We are here today with a mission to introduce the world to the crew of Artemis II. Four names, four explorers, four of my friends answering the call to once more rocket away from Earth and chart a course around the moon. Well, Joe, I... I agree with you, Joe, but uh, we're going to need a few more astronauts, yes, I think, are. to get this started. So everyone, please help me welcome our astronaut corps. Yeah. that sea of blue. Let's give them another round of applause. Yeah. Our mission calls for four names. It's difficult to pick just four from a group that by its very definition attracts the best and the brightest that humanity has to offer. The Astronaut Corps, our entire Astronaut Corps, will be the forerunners as humanity looks to find its place among the stars. So that while we may be recognizing four individuals today, I want to thank the entire Astronaut Corps for their dedication and sacrifice as we ask them to strap into our current and future spacecraft, take those next steps to do the things that are hard so that others might follow behind them. Now. Now, some of you might be scanning the astronaut faces, trying to see who is missing and still hidden backstage. Well, know this, your Artemis II crew members are already here in the room with you. But, 
because I love you all, I'm going to give you one hint. I am not one of them. <laughs> Don't be so happy about that. With Artemis One, we set out to prove that the hardware was ready. The SLS was prepared to launch our astronauts skyward. That Orion was equipped to carry them to the moon and back safely again. Artemis One was a resounding success, and Artemis Two will leverage that by putting humans in the loop, executing operations in the critical path, leading to new footprints on the lunar surface. This flight will be challenging, but we face that challenge with the confidence that the people working beside us are up to the task. Houston is home for us, and it's where we'll plan, train, and ultimately fly the Artemis II mission. To give us a proper Houston welcome, please join me in bringing out JSC Center Director Vanessa White. Thank you, Joe. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone here today to Ellington Field. NASA's Johnson Space Center is home of America's astronaut corps, mission operations, and foundational human space flight programs. This past December, we witnessed history as the Orion capsule journeyed on a 1.4 million mile journey around the moon and back. And the excitement continues as we prepare for Artemis II for the first time with crew. We've made many giant leaps in the past 60 years, fulfilling President Kennedy's goal of landing a person on the moon. And today, we stand on the shoulders of giants as we reach farther into the stars and push forward to the moon once again and on to Mars. These individuals of Artemis II crew will be the first humans to fly to the vicinity of the moon in more than 50 years. Yes. a moment to recognize those who paved the way, our Apollo legends, who are with us via the NASA Alumni League. Will you please wave? We're, we are also honored to be joined by some special guests. Please help me welcome NASA leadership. Administrator Bill Nelson, Deputy Administrator Pam Melroy, Associate Administrator Bob Cabana, and many of our NASA leaders who are from headquarters and all across our agency. We're also pleased to be joined by the international community. Representing the Canadian Space Agency is Minister Champagne.
international partnerships under Artemis, we're building a global alliance that explores deep space for the benefit of all. I'd also like to welcome the following elected officials. Senator Ted Cruz, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, Congressman Brian Babin, Congresswoman Lizzie Fletcher, the Comptroller of Texas, Glenn Hager, the Mayor Pro Tem of Houston, Dave Martin, and many other elected officials. Thank you. Right from in Texas, of course. This is all at Houston at the Johnson Space Center. So we're, right up, right up we're very appreciative of your continued support. Last but certainly not least, I'd like to give a shout out to the NASA workforce and all of those across the agency who came together to make this a very exciting moment and this moment in history happen. So thank you to our workforce. Joining us, joining us today are directors of our NASA centers. Will you please stand? So my colleagues. This mission represents the culmination of years of hard work and dedication by NASA and its partners. This is an exciting time for those working on the International Space Station, commercial crew, commercial LEO destinations, as we continue using those platforms and conduct deep space exploration with the Orion, Gateway, Human Landing System, and EVA programs. Together, our team of civil servants and contractors are enabling the success of the Artemis program. And this is only the beginning. For the students with us today from Houston and Clear Creek Independent School Districts and those watching, you are the future explorers, the future scientists, engineers, inventors, and mathematicians of the Artemis generation. <laughs> We will explore the frontiers of space and push the boundaries of what's possible. You may walk on the moon or be one of the many explorers who venture onward to Mars. We're all looking forward to you being a part of our mission, and I can't wait for you and everyone to meet our Artemis II crew. Thank you. The Artemis program is guided by decades of experience from sending humans to outer space. We're building new rockets, new spacecraft, new communication systems, and new ways to operate in deep space. But it isn't the technology that is changing. We've also learned that in order to go farther, we have to go together. Please join me in welcoming Minister Francois-Philippe Champagne. He's with us here from Canada, one of our steadfast partners in human spaceflight, ready to send one of their own to the moon. Thank you Minister. very much. Thank, thank you very, very much. much. Well, thank you, Joe, and uh, good morning, everyone. Bonjour, tout le monde. C'est un grand privilège d'être ici pour représenter Canada. To be here what an to honor to be here today to represent Canada on this historic day. In his recent visit to Ottawa, President Biden said this, Canada and the U.S. can do big things because we do them together. And indeed, <laughs> indeed, 50 years after the end of the Apollo missions, we are going back to the moon. Back to the moon. Think about that for a moment. The moon. As Minister responsible for the Canadian Space Agency, I know Canadians could not be more proud. Proud to have for the first time a Canadian astronaut who will travel to deep space as part of the Artemis II mission. <laughs> proud that we will be contributing to the future of the Lunar Gateway with the unique Canadian innovation, Canada Arm 3. That Canada will design, build, and operate a lunar utility vehicle to support operations on the lunar space. And proud 
of the 60 year plus of collaboration between NASA and the Canadian Space Agency, a partnership which is fueled by bold initiatives and scientific excellence. And most importantly, Canadians could not be more proud to share this moment with our American partners and friends which are here today in Houston. We would not be here today without the friendship and close partnership between our two nations. Because this is more than just about going back to the moon. This is about investing in the future. This is about possibilities. This is about seizing the opportunities of the space economy, from health to food security, to climate change, and much more. So as we embark together on this new space era, let's seize the moment. Let's be ambitious, and together, let's inspire the young people watching us to reach for the stars and become the next generation of scientists, engineers, and explorers. Merci tout le monde. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Nice to have a little bit of uh, Canadian flag waving there. He pumped me up. That was nice. <laughs> Next up is a group of people who need little introduction. Our agency leaders who know firsthand what it takes to fly in space. Please join me in welcoming NASA Administrator Bill Nelson, Deputy Administrator Pam Melroy, and Associate Administrator Bob Cabana. Hey everybody, members of the NASA family and the Canadian Space Agency, <clears throat> my colleagues, uh, my former colleagues, members of Congress, members of the Artemis generation, we are going. <laughs> Pam, Bob and I operate as a team, as a crew. And we are here today to introduce you to the crew that will uh, launch next year, 2024, to another celestial body. The largest, most powerful rocket in the world is going to propel them onward and upward into the heavens. And they fly to the moon. This is Artemis's Artemis II mission. It's a mission that is significant in many ways. It's a demonstration of our ability to push the boundaries of human achievement. It's a testament to the underwavering passion of the team that will make it possible. And it's a message to the world. We choose to go back to the moon and then on to Mars, and we're going to do it together. Because in the 21st century, NASA explores the cosmos with international partners. We will unlock new knowledge and understanding. We've always dreamed about what more is ahead. Why? Because it's in our DNA. It's part of us, it's who we are as adventurers, as explorers, as frontiers people. And throughout history, humankind has gazed up at this celestial body, the moon, with wonder. And the space program propelled the moon to the forefront of culture and consciousness. It galvanized a historic effort that we are now the stewards of. The moon is a symbol of our can-do spirit. And over the course of the Artemis missions, the first woman and the first person of color will take giant leaps on the lunar surface. It's been more than a half century since astronauts journeyed to the moon. Well, folks, that's about to change. 
The mission to the moon will launch four pioneers, but it will carry more than astronauts. Artemis II will carry the hopes of millions of people around the world. It will carry the aspirations of the NASA family who glance up at the moon every night knowing their efforts will return us to the moon. And it will carry the dreams of students who burn the midnight oil in libraries and laboratories, preparing one day to support an Artemis mission. And it'll carry the inspiration of the children who imagine themselves soaring in the skies. We will show what is possible when we dare to reach distant cosmic shores. The crew was selected by the Director of Flight Operations, Norm Knight, and the Chief Astronaut, Joe Acaba, and under the supervision of the Johnson Space Center Director, Vanessa Weiss. Will you all please join us up here? And I want to acknowledge again our Canadian partners, Minister Champagne, Francois Philippe, will you please come up, please? <laughs> the Artemis II crew represents thousands of people working tirelessly to bring us to the stars. This is their crew. This is our crew. This is humanity's crew. May I introduce them to you all? She's an engineer who got her start at Goddard and is no stranger to breaking records, logging the longest continuous space flight ever by a woman, your mission specialist, Christina Hammett Koch. He is a Master of Science in Physics, an F-18 pilot, and a Canadian astronaut. Your mission specialist, Jeremy Hansen. He's a naval aviator and test pilot that's flown over 40 different aircraft, most recently the first operational commercial crew mission. Your Artemis II pilot, Victor Glover. That's sweet. I met Victor Glover when I was in Houston. Two people voted. He 
He's a decorated naval aviator, test pilot, and leader of the highest character, your Artemis II commander, Reed Wiseman. Ladies and gentlemen, your Artemis II crew. Well, there we have it. The crew of Artemis II has been announced. And uh, Jeremy Hansen, Canadian astronaut, mission specialist on Artemis II, will loop around the moon later in 2024, according to the current schedule. Um, pretty cool to see all of this. I see that the internet has slowed to a crawl um that says something about how many people are watching this i'm not even sure if this broadcast is getting out in a timely fashion at this point because it's just slow um and the nasa site is pretty much swamped uh as every media person on the continent basically tries to learn about these four astronauts it does have a historical feel, actually, Boris. You're absolutely right. Um, it does kind of feel like this is a big deal. And I mean, it is. It's, it's one of those things that we're going to look back and say, hey, you know, we went to the moon and this was the first time. And I mean, oh, we're just going to listen in. I'm surrounded by people who inspire, who give hope to those that might follow in their footsteps. Christina, with a work ethic and willingness to lend a hand that only someone who spent their summers working on a farm growing up can have, your relentless drive is unmatched. You have already made your mark in the remote corners of our planet. You have already been in the history books as a record-setting astronaut. You're a trailblazer and a role model for every generation to come. You've already been advocating and uplifting children in your community, and I know that you are just getting started. And as the only professional engineer in the crew, I, <laughs> I know who Mission Control will be calling on when it's time to fix something on board. So uh, we appreciate you. <laughs> Victor, you wanted to be a hundred different things when you grew up, but I can say I'm truly thankful you ended up as a Navy pilot and an astronaut. Like so many, seeing other astronauts take flight planted the seed and when you heard Pam Melroy speak at a test pilot conference, that was the moment you decided to apply. So Pam, thank you for inspiring others. Victor, you were the first person in your family to graduate from college. And you always talk about how much of the love and support of those around you made your dreams possible. I can honestly say, I have never met anyone as determined as you are to spread that same love and support until everyone who passes into your orbit is better for it. You overcame every obstacle that came your way. Every obstacle. And then you dedicated your life to crushing those obstacles so that future generations can dream in a space unbounded. So thanks, Victor.
And finally, read and explore from the beginning. The forest of your youth might be smaller than the frontier that you're heading for now, but this was always you. It's what you were meant to be. You said for a time you wanted to be a train engineer, but I don't think trains go quite as fast as you need them to, so. <laughs> I wish the read of your youth, the ones that, you know, that you're dealing with bullies, dealing with the uncertainties of growing up, could meet you now. Meet the Reed who took his first jet for a spin and knew he was meant to soar across the skies. The Reed so who like found Jeremy a home and family rookie in the Navy the and here at NASA. Previous, the Reed who led our astronauts. Previous, uh, experience in terms of the uh, ability to, uh, you know, have actually having been in space. This will be Jeremy's first mission. It's going to be kind of hard to top that, hey, a flight to the moon. And uh, Kevin says, yeah, the, the, the height requirements Jeremy looks a little tall. Yeah, you know what? He's a tall guy. But uh, it turns out with Artemis, there's not really a height issue. I mean, I don't think they'd send somebody seven feet tall, but uh, there's, there's a lot of range there. He doesn't have to pack himself into a little Soyuz. I think he's going to talk about Jeremy next. Maybe not. We'll see. take his own place in history. Well, Jeremy, I'm not going to talk about your early life or your lovely family. I'm not going to talk about your military service and everything you did as a fighter pilot, an F-18 fighter pilot. I'm not even going to talk about what you did as an astronaut and being the first Canadian to go on a lunar mission. I want to talk about your humanity and share with the world a story when I was with you at the Kennedy Space Center and I saw the power of the blue suit where we had hundreds of people storming to Jeremy. But Jeremy did one thing. He talked to each and every one. You took the time to talk to all the school children who were there, the Artemis generation, and they are here today and watching us. You took the time to inspire them. You took the time to thank all the teachers who are there to support our kids and, and teach them STEM skills that will bring them in exploration and being the future astronauts. You took the time to talk to each and every family that were coming from around the world and across North America. What I want to celebrate to you is your humanity. The fact that you have been inspiring not only us today, but keep inspiring humanity to you, Jeremy. Go Canada! Thank you, everyone. Nice. Good street fighters on this crew, hey? On both sides of the uh, border. Pretty cool. But I, I would agree with everything that he just said on, uh, on Jeremy. Just a great guy. So here we have it. Reed, Victor, Christina, and Jeremy. Each of these adventurers has their own story, but together they represent our creed, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. This is the power of space. This is the power of our space program. It unites people. It brings them together. It brings parties together to explore, to discover, to dream. Together we will usher in a new era of exploration for a new generation of star sailors and dreamers, the Artemis generation. Together we are going to the moon, to Mars, and beyond. Big hand to our leadership. All right. You've heard from us, so now it's time to hear from your crew.
I'm going to clear the stage and I'm going to turn things over to our Artemis II commander, Reed Wiseman. All right, so I got to ask the school kids, is it hot in here today? Yeah. Woo! All right, and uh, I don't think that in my 14 years at NASA, we've had this many astronauts in one place at one time. I'm losing my voice. We're having so much fun backstage. It is great to see this diverse international group. Awesome to be here with you guys. <laughs> Woo! Uh, I'm going to hand it over to uh, the gentleman to my right here. Uh, Victor Glover, who has become, in the last few years, an amazing mentor to me. Uh, I didn't ask for it. He didn't ask for it. It just happened that way. Uh, one of the, the best leaders I know, one of the best dads, husbands, and friends, and, uh, and one of the most talented aviators I've ever met, Victor Glover. Thanks, Lee. I appreciate that. Wow, what a day. Look at all of this. This is amazing, isn't it? I mean, after all of that, I feel like Denzel Washington should be up here talking to you. <laughs> but you just got us. <laughs> I want to thank God for this amazing opportunity. And I, I think I speak for all of us. I want to thank our families for the amazing support. It is your love and support that has made this journey possible. Please give them a round of applause. And to all of the folks who made this celebration possible. Thank you for your hard work. They're the real ones in here sweating with all of us. <laughs> but this is a big day. We have a lot to celebrate. And it's so much more than the four names that have been announced. We need to celebrate this moment in human history. Because Artemis II is more than a mission to the moon and back. It's more than a mission that has to happen before we send people to the surface of the moon. It is the next step on the journey that gets humanity to Mars. Yeah, you can clap for that. That's big. And this, this crew, this crew will never forget that. Now, we have a lot of work to do before we get there, and we understand that. And when talking about that work, you, you may often hear people say, human spaceflight is a marathon, not a sprint. But we have watched the people that work so hard to make our mission possible, and I can tell you, it is a series of sprints. That's called a relay race. <laughs> Human spaceflight is like a relay race. And that baton has been passed generation to generation and from crew member to crew member. From the Gemini, Mercury Gemini, Apollo, Apollo Soyuz, Skylab, Mir, the shuttle, International Space Station, commercial crew, and, the, and now the Artemis missions. And we understand our role in that. And when we have the privilege of having that baton, we're going to do our best to run a good race to make you proud. I pray that God will bless this mission, but I also pray that we can continue to serve as a source of inspiration for cooperation and peace, not just between nations, but in our own nation. Thank you and God bless us all. Thanks, Victor. Awesome words. What I, uh, what I wanted to highlight for all of you today is, um, well, you know, big picture when I step back, there are two reasons why a Canadian is going to the moon. That makes me smile when I say that. <laughs> uh, the first one is American leadership. It is not lost on any of us that the United States could choose to go back to the moon by themselves. But America has made a very deliberate choice over decades to curate a global team. And that, in my definition, is true leadership. A body, an entity that seeks out others who can contribute, allows them to rise up, lifts them up to make their contributions to bring their genius. That is American leadership. And as a Canadian, I am very proud to reflect that back to you, and I am grateful all Canada is all of Canada is grateful for that global mindset and that leadership so thank you the second reason is 
Canada's can-do attitude. For <laughs> yeah. For decades now, literally thousands upon thousands of Canadians have risen to that challenge to bring real value to the international partnership with respect to space exploration, to bring real solutions. Our scientists, our engineers, the Canadian Space Agency, the Canadian Armed Forces, across government, all of our leadership working together under a vision to take step by step and all of those have added up to this moment where a Canadian is going to the moon with our international partnership and it is glorious. So at the end of it all, I am left in awe of being reminded what strong leadership, setting big goals with a passion to collaborate and a can-do attitude can achieve. And we are going to the moon together. Let's go. Thank you, uh, Victor. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Reed. It is an honor to be here. I also want to thank our families, the trailblazers, our colleagues, and our leadership. My fellow astronauts know that one of the questions we get all the time is, are you excited? And I can tell you, when I think about this mission that's a relay race with international partners, it's also so awesome in and of itself. We are going to launch from Kennedy Space Center through the work of the Exploration Ground Systems team. We're going to hear the words, go for launch on top of the most powerful rocket NASA's ever made, the Space Launch System. And we're going to ride that rocket for eight minutes into Earth orbit. We're not going to go to the moon right away. We're going to stay in an amazing high orbit, reaching a peak of tens of thousands of miles while we test out all the systems on Orion and even see how it maneuvers in space. And then, if everything looks good, we're heading to the moon. It will be a four-day journey going a quarter of a million miles, continuing to test out every bit of Orion, going around the far side of the moon, heading home, going through the Earth's atmosphere at over 25,000 miles per hour, and splashing down in the Pacific. So, am I excited? <laughs> Absolutely. But my real question is, are you excited? <laughs> I see you. And I ask that because the one thing I'm most excited about is that we are going to carry your excitement, your aspirations, your dreams with us on this mission, Artemis II. Your mission. Well, there you have it. The, the crew here of... Here, I'm just going to bring this down here. Thank you. That is thank you to the NASA workforce. Thank you to our industry partners. Thank you to the Canadian Space Agency, everyone in Europe that's working for this. we got people in Airbus uh, working our European service module. This is a global effort, Artemis II, and it's only going to get larger with Artemis III and beyond as we get private spaceflight involved. SpaceX is building our lander for Artemis III. So to the NASA workforce, to our program managers, our center directors that are here, the amazing political support that we feel right now to bring our country together, our world together to go explore, to get to Mars and beyond. We say a huge thank you. Uh, to the astronauts that are over here, a huge thank you. You are our friends, you are our families, you are our colleagues. And uh, I do want to highlight right now, there are seven folks on the International Space Station. Where's Joel? On Joel's International Space Station, orbiting our planet right now. Three cosmonauts, 
three Americans and an Emirati from the United Arab Emirates. If any of you over there are looking for heroes today, go Google these folks, because they're our heroes. And I definitely want to call out our friend Frank Rubio, who uh, has already spent six months up there. And Frank is going to spend another six months due to a, uh, an issue with his spacecraft. So he'll be up in space for over an entire year. All right, that man is a hero. For sure. And then... And then Frank Rubio leads me to Deb Rubio, his wife and his four kids. That family, those are heroes. They are putting it out there and they are getting the job done and it is amazing. And she still gives us eggs fresh from her chickens at her farm whenever we go over there. I mean, it's totally awesome. The Rubio family is an amazing family. And that brings the four of us to our families who are in the audience with us. This is going to be a relay race unlike any you've ever run. And we are so happy to have you with us. Thank you. Well, there you have it, the crew of Artemis II. Commander Victor Glover, pilot Reed Wiseman, mission specialists Christina Koch, and Jeremy Hansen from the Canadian Space Agency. The four of them will be going to the moon according to the current schedule before the end of 2024. There's already some thought that there may be slippage and so on. I mean, there are, there's... Uh, an election year coming up in the States, there's budget issues, there's uh, some troubles with the International Space Station, as you heard him allude, allude to. The, there have been a, a couple of Russian spacecraft that have sprung leaks, which uh, means that, you know, the lifeboat and the supplies are uh, going at a, a slower rate. There's no major danger. They've got replacement spacecraft up there, but still it's, uh, it's throwing things for a loop. So it is definitely... Um, an interesting time for space flight. We'll, we'll have to see. We'll follow very carefully, of course, Jeremy's um, career and training, and hopefully the Canadian Space Agency will announce who his backup is going to be. And there's always a backup astronaut in case somebody gets hit by a bus or something, or just is unable to go for whatever reason. I mean, there have been cases in the Apollo um, missions where a crew got the measles, and a day before the launch, the primary crew was grounded and the new crew went into space instead. Or not, not the entire crew, but part of the crew. So that's what you have backups for. We'll have to see what happens. It's been great uh, being back on the air with you folks. Nice to see so many popular uh, or, or familiar names out there. And uh, we will be coming back with some more programming uh, through the Dome at Home series. Dome at Home is still on hiatus, but we'll be coming back in, a, in some form, and I'll have some details on that fairly soon. Thanks again for joining us. Great to see you all, and let's uh, keep looking at the skies. Bye, everybody. <laughs>